Let me say first of all that uh, I'm going to assume everyone knows at least the outlines of John James Audubon's story, this implausible story of a guy who is French by birth, illegitimate son of a sea captain, uh, a failure as a businessman, goes west, which meant the Ohio Valley at that time, and has this insane idea of creating the greatest bird book ever made in America or anywhere else. The first time birds are going to be displayed in their entirety, in their lifelike form, in their full true size in a printed work. Uh, there's no reason why he should have been able to even think of this. He wasn't trained as an artist. He wasn't trained as an ornithologist. There's no, certainly no reason he should have been able to pull it off. But he did because of sheer drive, determination, uh, insane ambition, uh, very supportive wife, and, and just an amazing, amazing talent. So the bare outlines of the story uh, are that. Uh, he creates this book over a 12-year process. Uh, program. He sells it by subscription in Europe and the United States, and it ultimately becomes the most expensive book ever sold at auction, $12 million, a full set of the double bells and balls and so forth. Uh, in the middle, though, uh, the thing about Audubon is that there are a hundred fabulous stories throughout his life of things that he did and things that he, his two sons, John Woodhouse and, and, and Victor Gifford Audubon, were involved in his, his amazing wife, Lucy, and her, she could have a story of her own. Uh, but one key uh, story in the legacy of, of Audubon concerns the area you guys love so deeply, and that is, is uh, the Labrador and the Quebec coast. Uh, John Audubon, a couple things to remember, he's really in many ways an 18th century man, not a 19th century man. He was born in 1785. So he comes to the United States, he's there in the early 1800s. America is still wild, it's still new. Uh, uh, the wildlife surrounds him, and he's completely taken by this, uh, to the point where, as I said before, his businesses fail, and he decides to do this book project. And I say 19th century, 18th century man because his style of being a field naturalist, which is what he was, was old school. Uh, he shot the birds, and he stuffed them, and he drew them, and that's the way you did ornithology back in those days. And he was very, very close to nature. He spent a lot of time in the field. He criticized his colleagues or his contemporary ornithologists for not getting out in the woods enough and not living with the birds. And he knew their behavior so thoroughly. Uh, but he was also an avid hunter. Uh, and he was, uh, he writes in his bird biography these very eloquent passages that would appeal to anybody who loves to hunt. He's passionate about getting the bird and he'll go through all kinds of things to do it. Uh, so he creates this book over a 12-year period, right about in the middle, or the early stages of the middle, in 1833. He comes back from England, where he's had his first initial success. He's sort of flush with cash. He's raised enough money to pay Havel, his engraver, to move on with the project. And he decides he's running out of birds in the southeastern United States, which is what he knew the best, in the Ohio Valley. And he decides he's going to go north. And he, he goes to Boston, and then he goes to Maine. And he waits and waits, and through machinations, he leases the Ripley, a hundred uh, ton uh, schooner. And he and his son and a bunch of their colleagues, all young men, not Audubon, but the rest of them are all young men. They're all their 20s. Uh, they get on this ship, they outfit it themselves, and they go up and they, uh, they explore for three long, cold, miserable months. Uh, the summer in, in Labrador. <laughs> he describes an iceberg being blown up on the beach at the end of August. <laughs> uh, he was a terrible sailor, too. Audubon was a terrible sailor. He was seasick all the time. Uh, and uh, he was also a bit of a gourmand, and he really suffered from the terrible food. And so this was a hardship for him. Uh, but at the end of three months, he came back with 23 full-sized drawings of birds many of which ended up in the famous birds of America. He also ended up with 75 shot and stuffed specimens of birds that he, that he took in, in and around uh, Labrador and, and you know, the coast of Quebec. And as I say, that's how ornithology was done at that time. He would bring them home, he would stuff them, he would mount them in this sort of bizarre contraption he had to put them in their attitude of life, and he would paint from that because he didn't know how else to do it. Uh, he was, to think about the Labrador trip in part, uh, it, it, it was a development of him as an artist, but it really was the point at which you start to hear him talk like a conservationist. If you read through his diaries and his correspondence and so forth, uh, he, makes, he makes, here's a, what shocks him is the Eggers. 
these guys who are, who are sailing out onto the islands and they're killing all of the eggs that they can find so that the birds will come back and lay new eggs and they'll have fresh ones to take to the market. And that was the business. And he was quite shocked with their lack of concern about the future. This is what he read. This is what he wrote. Last year, upwards of 20 sail were engaged in egging. So some idea may be formed of the birds that are destroyed in this rascally way. The eggers destroy all the eggs that are sat upon to force the birds to lay again. And by robbing them regularly, they lay till nature is exhausted, and few young are raised. In less than half a century, these wonderful nurseries will be entirely destroyed, unless some kind government will interfere to stop this shameful destruction. That's really the first time you see this 18th century free-spirited American frontiersman say, wait a minute, there's got to be a bigger picture here. Somebody has got to step in and stop us from continuing to, to sort of ravage the natural world for our own benefit. And I think it was a turning point for him uh, as, as, a, as a conservation, as, as a naturalist even. Later on in his writings, he talks a lot about the regrets he had for being such an avid hunter. He shouldn't have shot birds just for the pleasure of it, and he should have limited himself to the things that he needed for his collection. Uh, and I think the Labrador trip was a powerful uh, step in, in, in reaching that. Uh, it was a three-month journey. It was just one of a hundred good stories that Audubon tells. Uh, but because we're privileged to have the, uh, the, uh, the New York Historical Society across the park, uh, I want to take five more minutes if I can Larry, with Larry's kind indulgence. And just show you a couple of things uh, that we saw across the park that I find very, very interesting and very exciting about him as an artist as opposed to as a naturalist. Because you can start to understand how those two parts of Audubon come together. Uh, we had six of the engravings here in the gallery up until our most recent sale uh, that were also represented by the watercolors across the park. And uh, so I thought it'd be very interesting to compare them. This is the first of the ones. I'm taking them in play order. This is play number 325. This is a bird that should be familiar to many of you who love that region. Uh, it's a cold weather, cold weather duck. And at the top, at the bottom, we have the watercolor that's across the park. And at the top, we have the uh, a great engraving by Robert Havel and sold as part of the subscription to the Birds of America. Uh, what does this tell us? It tells us one thing that when Audubon wanted to do a complete image of a bird, he did it, and Havel sent a copy to him. So as an artist, this is a complete work. It's very, very highly accurate. It's the attitude of the bird is right. And that's part of what Audubon's genius was. He can capture the way birds actually stand, crawl, swim, sleep, fly, as opposed to just being static uh, uh, models on, the, uh, on, a, on a stand, which is what the naturalists before him tended to do. But that's a, it's a very interesting thing. This was painted actually in 1833 while he was in Maine waiting to go to Labrador. The weather was bad, the ship wasn't ready, and Audubon did not sit around ever. He was an incredibly energetic man. And so he went out in the field, he saw these ducks, and he painted uh, this in Maine just on the eve of his trip to Labrador. Let's do the next one. This is a dusky duck, or a dusky grouse, he called it. Uh, I've never really liked this image, which is amazing because I love grouse. Uh, but I always thought it was a little bit static. You know, it looks a little stiff, and it's not all that. Exciting. I'm talking about the engraving. I'd never seen this before. Then I look at this and I said, well, you know, it's still got some of the same faults. It's better, but it's still a little stiff. Uh, and then I read that Audubon never saw this bird in life. This is painted from a stuffed bird, a skin, because this is a Rocky Mountain bird, and he, made it, he never made it that far away. So you're seeing a bird that he's never seen in life, and you can see the difference. Even Audubon, being a genius, can't. Remember what our docent said about the landscape? Is that imagine? Precisely. This is an imaginary landscape. He'd never seen the Rocky Mountains. He didn't know what they looked like. He actually probably got it fairly close here. Havel got it wrong. This is this is more like Scotland, right? This looks like a lake country in England. Uh, it's very romanticized. Look, he's got these beautiful waterfalls. And, you know, there's maybe a disconnect between the engraver at this stage and, and, and the artist. They're not seen quite high. Uh, the next. Now here's one that was across the park. I think those of you who went over there this afternoon will remember this. This is a trumpeter swan. This is the young trumpeter swan. Uh, again, a very complete work of art. One of his best as far as the bird is concerned. Uh, here, rather. And here's the engraving. Havel simply substitutes an engraved form for the painting. He doesn't add a great deal himself, nor should he. 
one of the interesting things about this is that it demonstrates that the birds don't appear in the book in the order that they were painted. He actually painted this in New Orleans in 1821. When he was brand new to the project, he'd not been to England yet, he didn't even know if he was going to have a project. But he, so he created a very, very complete work of art, which Hevel reproduced pretty much as you see. Now we're getting to something a little different. This is a scarlet ibis, or ibis. You guys got to tell me how to it. Ibis. ibis. Uh, this again is a bird that he never saw, or at least he saw it once. He said in Bayou Sarah, in Louisiana, when a couple of them flew over, he was convinced they were native. They probably aren't, I think. Bird people here will know far more than I do. But anyway, they are scarce of that in the, in the northern uh, United States. And in fact, these were painted from samples, from specimens that he received, probably from Trinidad. Uh, here's the painting. As you can see, he gets the bird, and then he hands it to the engraver and says, finish it up for me, Robert. Hmm. And Robert is afraid to move the birds relative to each other. He doesn't want to screw up the size of the relationship, so he puts this little thing here. So <laughs> One of the things, this one, the watercolor, really tells you when you go over there is that and we get this question all the time. People say, what's the original? Aren't the originals the watercolor? These engravings, are these the originals? Audubon didn't paint a bunch of beautiful birds and then decide to make copies of them to sell. He painted birds in order to make the engravings. That was the point. His work of art is the book, not the paintings. And that's why he doesn't have to finish them. And that's why he can be sloppy. He, in this particular painting, if you go across the park, you'll see this is sliced right across here, and he's put new feet on because he didn't like the first feet. He doesn't try to cover it up, he just slaps it together because what he needs is something Robert Havel can copy in the form of an engraving. And that's his, that's really his art, his genius is up here, and the collaboration that they're doing. This little white stripe here, which I guess is uh, characteristic of this particular bird in, in that stage of its plumage, he's impatient. He can't get it just right, so instead of painting that little white stripe, he cuts out the pigment. So what you're seeing is the white paper through. He was a very, very adventurous, aggressive artist, and there's no reason for it because no one can figure out where he learned to do these things. So he just did it himself. He used watercolor, chalk, pencil, pen, oil paints. He scratched grooves and things. He would cut things. He would put sparkling material in them. He was a very, very uh, adventurous. Can you comment on that partnership? The last slide. Remember how we were told by the docent that the landscaping was just the trust factor between between he and Howell. So look at the top slide there. Yep. That's an imaginary landscape. Completely. Completely. He probably told him, you know, tropical swamp, kind of thing, southern swamp. And by then, you know, they've been doing this for a while. Havel knows what a swamp looks like, even though he's been here. Thank you. Next one. This is, my, this is one of my favorites that's demonstrating this amazing collaboration. This is the, the uh, uh, mature trumpeter swan, a very, very impressive large bird, obviously. And one of the reasons this particular engraving is so famous and so sought out by collectors is because of the water. It's genius the way the water looks solid enough to carry the bird and hold it up like it's floating, but you can still see through it and see all the details. I always thought that was Audubon being a genius, but it's happening. Audubon didn't do the water, he left it up to his engraver. Have also does this, which he does in a number of instances, he adds a, a reason for the bird to be in the attitude that it's in. Uh, he's confronted with, with Audubon's painting, which puts the neck of the bird around the back. Audubon, of course, has to do that, we all know, because he had to fit it on the piece of paper. But Havel says, okay, why is the bird doing this? It's either scratching itself or cleaning itself or cleaning or whatever, or let's give it a reason. So he adds a butterfly to give the bird a reason for its attention to that part of the place. So this, this one really brought home to me the fact that this was an intense collaboration between these two men. It wasn't just Audubon uh, himself that created this great work of art. And the final one is one of my favorites, because this gets real complicated. This is a, a, he calls it a western duck. It's a Sellers Eider. I think I'm in there or right, right? Again, a bird he never saw. This is a western bird. It's uh, Rocky Mountains, maybe, or over in the, uh, the Columbia. Is it Alaska? It's, it's, I know it's Western. And uh, so he, this is very late in the series. He's really busy. He's getting a little worn out. And his, he's trained his son to help him. Uh, John Woodhouse Audubon is an artist in his own right. So he tells Woodhouse Audubon, who's in London, working with Hevel, 
you do this work. I'm not going to see it anyway. Go find one in London and do it. So he goes to a museum in London and finds a stuffed duck, and his son does, and paints it. And this is the result right here. This is by John Woodhouse Audubon. Well, John James sees it and goes, I love my son, but I'm not sure he's quite got it. So he does this, John James does. And tells Havel, use his, use my son's work, but, and here's what Havel does. He writes the two ducks in the same frame, and it takes maybe the best part of the son's work to be in the head, and not the sort of awkward falling over on his back tail posture. And he substitutes what Audubon is so good at, which is depicting a bird that's about to move, just about to head down the, down the little ramp. Audubon gets that late in motion somewhere. Anyway, Larry, I apologize for going so far over, but this is how